What's up guys and welcome back to another episode of Shark Bites, where some people have said in the past is the best place online to get your shark fix. If you're watching this episode right now, hopefully you've been directed here by part one, which is where we ask the question, are there great white sharks in the UK? If you haven't watched part one yet, what are you doing? Go back and watch part one. This is part two, so it's really important you watch part one first. Now it's time to strap yourselves in as we're going to run through the top five most credible great white shark sightings in British waters. I say most credible here because all of the sightings that you're going to hear about today are unconfirmed. This mostly means that they weren't able to be 100% verified because they lacked a good quality picture or a video. Some of these sightings that you're going to hear about today have been discussed by globally renowned shark scientists. So although they're not 100% confirmed, know that there at least is a little bit of weight behind them. Before we start though, if you're enjoying Shark Bites, please do give the video a like and maybe even leave a comment as well. When you do that, you massively help out the channel. So thanks from me. Okay, right. Let's hear about some of these sightings. At number five, we have the Falmouth Great White in the summer of 1965. First off, I absolutely love this one because I live here in Falmouth and back in the 60s and 70s, it used to be a real hotspot for shark game fishing. Those who fished for sharks out of Falmouth have so many stories to tell and the pub that I occasionally work in here in Falmouth has a few of those fishers. Big shout out to the Odd Fellows pub, by the way. Anyway, back in the summer of 1965, some shark anglers had been losing their catches to a very large unidentified fish. One of the sharks that was hooked and then subsequently lost was an 800 pound mako shark. For those of you that might struggle to visualize what an 800 pound mako shark might look like, here's a picture of a 900 pound one. So you can see it's a big, big fish. So if something is taking your 800 pound mako off the line, then we're talking about an unusually large fish for these waters. The following story involves three people, Harry Duckfield, who was a businessman and keen shark fisherman, and then Robbie Vinicum and Doug Phillips, who both owned boats and were also keen anglers. The three would regularly talk to each other over the radio when they were out fishing in Falmouth waters. Anyway, a few days before the incident that I'm gonna to talk to you about, Harry was out fishing. He was using a plastic laundry basket hanging over the side of his boat as a rubby dubby container. Rubby dubbies are basically bait boxes that anglers use to chum the water and lure larger fish into the area. So Harry radioed into Robin in almost a hysterical tone. He said, and I quote here, Harry here, Rob, a bloody great shark has just come up and eaten the bloody rubby dubby basket. Now, Robin, knowing Harry quite well, said that he wasn't usually one to get overexcited. He was a pretty chilled out guy. But on that day, he was, and he'd never ever heard him react like that before. For reference, this is the size of a standard laundry basket. So whatever had taken Harry's that day was a big fish. A few days later, Doug Phillips and Robin were out fishing together with a few others on board when Doug's fishing reel started to give off a few clicks. That's actually one of the things that's shown really nicely in the film Jaws when the reel starts starts clicking really subtly and Quint notices it, but the other two, Brody and Hooper, don't notice it at all. According to anglers, that's often the only indication that a large fish has taken the hook. Doug waited for another few clicks on the reel before reeling the line in hard and striking. The hook latched immediately and he knew straight away that he had got a big, big fish on the end of his line. Strangely, within minutes, the shark that they had hooked was alongside the boat and those on board couldn't believe their eyes. All of the fishermen on board were no strangers to shark fishing and had seen big makos in the past several times. But according to them, the shark that was beside their boat was between 12 and 14 feet long. Robin decided to poke it with the gaff handle and the shark just took off, completely soaking everyone on board. And for the next four and a half hours, Doug battled with this monster shark on the end of his line. Repeatedly, the shark resurfaced and took off again. It circled the boat and dived deep again and again with everyone on board watching intently. But then disaster the line went slack. The 250 pound braided steel line had frayed on the shark's teeth and it swam off into the deep. Around 10 people witnessed the incident on the boat that day and I feel like it would be pretty strange for all 10 of them to just fabricate this story. At the time it was reported as an 800 pound mako and Robin reported it as that because he didn't think anyone would believe him if he said it was a white. Now there's no doubt a big mako shark could look like a smaller great white shark. The two are regularly mistaken. And although the shark was clearly visible for more than an hour during the four and a half hour battle, in that time, no one managed to see the teeth. That would have been the key detail in determining what species of shark this is. Makos have very, very distinct teeth that look nothing like great white shark teeth. But the fact that the stainless steel trace on the line was frayed and then severed suggests that the teeth that severed it were serrated. Mako sharks have smooth, curved, needle-like teeth, whereas great white shark teeth are serrated. And the final interesting point to make on this story was the behavior of the shark. Mako sharks, when they're hooked, in the majority of cases, will leap out of the water, and there are loads of clips of Mako's doing this online. And the shark that was hooked by Doug and his cohort that day did most of its battling in deeper water and didn't breach once. Great white shark or a very big non-breaching Mako? 
I'm not sure. Okay, at number four, we've got the Lou sighting in Cornwall, July 1970. John Reynolds was a shark angling skipper who was based out of Lou on the south coast of Cornwall. He'd been out all day about eight miles offshore with baited lines in the water and two of those rubby dubby chum bags dangling over the side of the boat. In 1970, Paul Beagle and blue shark sightings were a lot more common than what they are today. So John thought it was a little bit unusual that he had seen neither of those two species all day. And John thinks the reason for the lack of these two other shark species indicated the presence of a larger predator in the water. At around 3 p.m., John decided that he'd had enough and he started taking in his lines and his chum bags before returning to shore. He was pulling up the chum bag at the stern of the boat when a large shark popped up on the surface of the water just a few feet behind the boat. The shark poked its head just out of the water, looking directly at John and remained in a head up position for a few seconds before slipping below the waves. John only saw the head of the shark, but the description that he gave does fit that of a great white shark. The white shark is one of a few select shark species that has been seen performing the spy hopping behavior. It's rare to see spy hopping in non-baited conditions, so we're not 100% sure on its function as of yet. Some people have said white sharks perform this spy hopping behavior so that they can look at their surroundings from the surface, whereas others have suggested it's a response to concentrated scent stimuli at the surface of the water from chum lines. Regardless, the only other shark species that I can think of off the top of my head that has performed spy hopping is the seven gill shark. We do get sharp nosed seven gills here in the UK, although they are very different in morphology to that of a great white shark. And I would have imagined that a well experienced shark angler like John would be able to tell the difference between the two. Right, next up at number three, we've got the Queez Islands in North Cornwall, July 2002. On a clear windless day in July 2002, Brian Bate was laying his lobster pots just to the northeast of those islands. Suddenly a large fish, somewhere between 12 and 15 feet in length, completely leapt out of the water with something in its mouth. Brian headed over to the spot immediately and came across a spreading pool of blood with bits of seal blubber floating around in the water. Although he wasn't a shark angler, Brian described the fish as best as he could and the description does fit that of a great white shark. He was also showed images of breaching sharks by Richard Pierce when he was being interviewed. The images included breaching makos, breaching threshers, and breaching great white sharks. And in every single picture, he was able to accurately identify the great white shark. It's actually such a shame that Brian wasn't able to retrieve any of the pieces of floating blubber as it could have been sent off for bite mark analysis. Or if he was even luckier, we might have even got a rogue loose tooth. Although he did say at the time he didn't really fancy putting his hands in the water after what he'd just witnessed. So based on Brian's description of the animal, we can probably rule out makos and blue sharks. Blues definitely aren't going to be breaching and predating on seals. And while a mako shark definitely could breach, its teeth aren't designed in the right way for dismembering seals like this one was. There's poor beagles as well, and maybe they are big enough to take on a seal, but I don't think their teeth are serrated enough to cause this much damage. This leaves maybe a killer whale, and we do get killer whales here in the UK, but Brian had seen loads of those over the years and he was very confident that what he saw was not a killer whale. Two days after Brian had seen this breaching shark, a lone yachtsman was sailing up the coast of Cornwall from Newquay to Padstow. And that's right around the area where the breaching incident took place. He later described how a large shark had followed in his wake for the majority of his journey. The yachtsman was pretty familiar with basking sharks and he was certain that the fin that was following him was not a basking shark. Richard Pierce, the former director of the Shark Trust, went out chumming with Brian in the same area a few weeks after the breaching incident. And both of them reported that there were no seals to be seen anywhere. That was pretty unusual because normally there's a colony of around 15 to 20 seals in that area. And that seal colony didn't return to the area for another four months after the incident. Two cases of washed up seal carcasses were reported to Richard Pierce, one that was shortly before the breaching incident, and then one a few weeks later in August. Sadly, these carcasses were only partial remains and both had been considerably pecked at by scavenging seabirds. And that made it impossible for those investigating to determine how those seals died or learn anything about the nature of their wounds. Up next at number two, it's the Blue Fox sighting in North Cornwall, August 1999. Mike Turner, Phil Britz, and his wife Rona were all aboard the Blue Fox, a relatively small boat, when they saw a large shark about 40 yards away. The dorsal fin was clearly visible and was making a beeline for them as they were releasing a taupe shark that they'd just caught. The shark, which they estimated to be around four and a half meters long, passed the stern and rolled over on its side. And this revealed a clear white underbelly separated from the grayish brown top side by a jagged line. The shark was visible for around a minute, having come within two meters from the side of the boat. The witnesses also noticed a very large black eye, and when you combine it with the coloration description, it does fit that of a great white shark. Mike had seen loads of white sharks in South Africa as he used to run a fishing charter out there, and he was very adamant about his sighting. And the other passengers on board had seen loads of poor beagle sharks and loads of basking sharks and ruled those out pretty quickly. The following day, two other people were out fishing for taupe sharks in exactly the same location as the blue fox was. The 
two anglers, Paul and Jason, had hooked a decent-sized tope shark and were about to lift it in the boat before an even larger shark appeared and bit the bottom two-thirds of that tope shark off before swimming away. Paul says he estimated the shark to be at least the length of his boat, which was five meters long. And he described it in exactly the same manner as those on the blue fox the day before. Two weeks later, a lobster fisherman found a very large shark entangled in his rope near Tintagel Head. That's about 12 miles away from the blue fox location. The shark he described was four and a half meters long and because of the size of it, the lobster fisherman initially thought it was a basking shark. But again, he went on to describe it as having a gray slate top side. And then as it rolled out of his net, it revealed a clear white underbelly. And interestingly here, the lobster fisherman also noticed triangular shaped teeth. Basking sharks and Paul Beagle sharks were familiar to that fisherman and the other people on board that day. And eventually they convinced themselves that it was neither of those two sharks. But because the shark had no commercial value to this particular fisherman, he cut it loose from the net and left it behind. So we've got three independent sightings there. All describe the shark being around the same size and coloration within a 12 mile radius of each other over the space of around three weeks. Could it be a coincidence? Was it the same shark? I think it's important important to note here that after the blue fox sighting, one of those on board that day leaked it to the press. And the day after the second sighting by Paul and Jason, news articles were being written about a large shark in Cornish waters. And because it was leaked to the press, we could say that any sighting after the blue fox sighting on the 24th of August and the Paul and Jason sighting on the 25th of August could be discounted because of influence from the press. But still, they are three very interesting sightings here in Cornwall and do have a little bit of weight behind them considering that all three are from independent sources. And so finally, at number one, we've got the Dr. Green Street sighting and the George Carter photo in Scotland, July 2003. Now, I know there's gonna be a few of you who watched part one who are gonna be saying, hang on a minute, he said in part one that Scotland was way too cold for great white sharks. And yet, you'd be absolutely right, I did say that the majority of the time. I think that Scottish waters are just a little bit too cold for great white sharks generally. But in the summer of 2003, much of the UK, including Scotland, was gripped in the middle of a blistering heat wave. June and July 2003 combined were the warmest since Scottish temperature series began in 1961. And to this day, Scotland's highest ever temperature was recorded that summer at a whopping 32.9 degrees Celsius. Now that is very warm for Scotland and you can probably bet that the sea surface temperature for that summer was also quite warm. I don't have the exact numbers to hand, but it would have been warmer than usual. Anyway, Dr. Simon Greenstreet was diving near Ullapool in Western Scotland in July 2003. Simon is a marine biologist, so I'd back him with his skills in identification for sea creatures. In the group was his wife and two other divers in a 17 foot rigid inflatable boat. The Greenstreets had just finished their dive and the other two were gearing up to get in the water before they spotted a large shark fin about 30 yards away. So straight off the bat here, you'd probably say this was a basking shark. Dr. Greenstreet decided to move the boat a little bit closer to the shark because it's not often you get the opportunity to swim with a peaceful basking shark. But as soon as the boat engine started, the shark changed course and headed straight for the boat. When it was about 15 yards away, the group could see the bulk of the shark and they estimated the distance between the tip of the dorsal and the tip of the tail was around nine feet, which is three meters. And it was at this point in time that Dr. Greenstreet and his group no longer believed that this was a basking shark. The shark continued on its approach, eventually swimming right alongside the boat about half a meter away. Way. Those on board judged the shark to be around four and a half meters long in comparison to the length of their boat. Dr. Greenstreet wasn't a shark scientist and had no real experience working with sharks before, but he had seen plenty of basking sharks in his time in Scotland and was convinced that this was not a basking shark. Unlike basking sharks, according to Dr. Greenstreet, this shark had a very clearly defined white ventral side. He went on to describe it having a large triangular dorsal fin, a light gray dorsal side, and worn patches over the top of the body. And supposedly it had significantly smaller gill slits than that of the very large ones found on basking sharks. The description does fairly accurately fit that of a great white shark, and to this day it remains probably one of the most convincing great white shark sightings in our waters. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Just under two weeks after the Green Street sighting, George Carter, a fisherman, was netting for codling. He was fishing in the northeast of Scotland near the port of Libster, which is around 70 nautical miles away from the Green Street sighting in Western Scotland. As George approached his net, he saw some disturbance in the water and two particularly large fins. The shark in his net was well entangled and it had probably gone for some of the fish that were in the net. At first, George thought it was a basking shark, which he was pretty familiar with with as he'd fished those waters for most of his life. And he estimated it to be around 18 feet long. As George was trying to disentangle the shark, it set off in a southwesterly direction for around 200 meters, dragging the net and George with it. It eventually started to tire and became more subdued before eventually sinking. At this point, George decided to tow it along the bottom as he hoped it might free 
itself from the net. He towed it around 300 meters towards a nearby cliff where he dropped anchor and left a boy marker on it. After this, he headed back to port to try and figure out what to do and on his way back, bumped into his friend Dodd Bremner. Dodd agreed to help George free the shark and help him get his net back. By the time the two had got back to the shark, it had resurfaced, clearly showing the gills and the dorsal. George managed to grab his camera and took just one picture while Dodd was at the net. Just after George took the picture, the shark exploded with movement and shot free away from the net. Both of the fishermen agreed that the shark they had just freed was no basking shark. It was a shark that neither of them had seen in Scottish waters. Now the photo that I'm about to show you that George took is about as grainy and blurry as you might expect from a photograph taken from 2003. But here it is. It's tough to see from the angle whether we're looking at a pectoral or a dorsal fin there, but what you can see is that shark is undoubtedly grey. It's not got that brownish hue that basking sharks have, so this is most definitely not a basking shark. This particular photo was sent to a few shark scientists around the world, most notably Ian Ferguson and Leonard Campagno, two of the world's leading specialists in great white sharks. Ian and Leonard both said that had they not been told the photo was taken in Scotland, and had they instead been told it was taken in Australia or South Africa or California, their first choice for an ID would have been a great white shark. But because they were told it was Scotland, their minds began thinking, what else could it have been? It's interesting to think that if the question was, I think this is a great white shark, what do you think? That two globally renowned shark scientists would both have said that that was a great white shark. And it would mean that that photo taken by George Carter in Scotland 2003 would be the first proof of great white sharks in British waters. Based on the size estimates given by George, which was 18 feet, and the size estimates given by Dr. Greenstreet and his group a few weeks earlier, it's hard to argue that this wasn't a great white shark. This is one of those where you wish he'd managed to take just a couple of more pictures, maybe of the head or of the teeth, if only, eh? So there we go, guys. Those are, in my opinion, the top five great white shark sightings in British waters. Let me know what you think in the comments. Which one of those was your favorite? Which one did you believe the most? I want to hear all your thoughts below. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, please do give it a like and don't forget to subscribe to the Shark Bites channel below by clicking that big red subscribe button. And that way you can stay up to date with all of our latest videos. Until then, see you next time.